Welcome back. It's Wednesday and uh, I'm looking forward to this one. This this is something that has been requested many times and so I thought we got to cover this because <laughs> you know what if you don't have a good composition what do you have? Like you, you're building on something that is weak in the first place so you're not going to end up with a successful painting no matter how uh, carefully you draw each of those little elements in your painting and everything but um, you want to make sure that you have a good composition to start with that's the foundation so uh, a lot of you are signing in here we've got people from all over again <laughs> and uh, it seems like it's warm in most places yeah pretty pretty warm here we're having our August in September it seems <laughs> so um, <clears throat> doesn't say I'm live I hope I'm live <laughs> I think it I think I am all right so uh, let's take a look here and uh, one of the first things that we need to to figure out is why okay so when you're talking about composition what's the goal right so the goal is keep them in your painting for as long as possible that's it that's the goal and uh, you want to keep them engaged and and there's a lot of ways that we can kind of do a lot of things we can do in order to make that happen just based on what we know about you know how we're hardwired and uh, you know our expectations or the uh, we you know we can predict how somebody's going to react when you do certain make certain marks or lines and things like that in your composition so let's let's get on with this so I'm just going to use a piece of paper here and a couple of markers. The first thing is what's the format? You usually end up taking your your canvas or your paper or whatever to a location and then you start looking for what to uh, what to compose and you're overwhelmed by what you see so this is something that I recommend that you have and it is a this is called a view catcher but basically here's how it works this is your opening and you can choose to open it right up and do a square close it up and do a rectangle and the idea is that you hold this uh, away from you and you can look through the viewfinder this part here and it it has enough gray around it to block out other things so that you can actually see what's going to end up on your on your canvas so first of all let's have a quick chat about the canvas so obviously you can start square you can start horizontal <clears throat> vertical uh, but there's other options too. Uh, you might even go uh, oval or round. What about panorama? Long format or long uh, tall vertical. There's a lot of options. So as you're thinking about your composition, think about the format. Now, if you're one of those people that works from photographs, as I do quite often, sometimes what you start off with uh, like you'll you'll have a a predetermined size in mind. So let's say it's a uh, you want to work a half sheet of watercolor. In my case, that is a 15 inch by 22 inch. Okay, so you've got 15 inches and 22 inches, which is a little bit kind of a little bit elongated. Then you have your reference picture. Now, if you're still printing your reference pictures, most formats end up being like um, four by six right so if you print it out you have a four by six so here's what I suggest you put your four by six in the corner so this is the photo right that's the photo and this is the canvas or paper all right so here's what you need to do you either take a, a ruler and you draw a straight line like this or like from from the corner of the photo and kind of keep that going 
or you go directly to the corner of the canvas. And sometimes they're not exactly the same thing. There, there might be a slight difference. So that tells you you're either going to have to change the size of your canvas or you're going to have to crop something out of the photo. So that little uh, thing is very important. I have seen many times, many, many times, somebody takes uh, a pad of, of watercolor paper, for example. It opens up sort of this way, right? So they're doing a landscape and they end up doing it this way, vertically, because that's the way their pad of paper opens. And uh, of course, that's not going to work out very well proportionately. You know, that'd be like putting your photograph like this and expecting the corners to end up in, in line. But if they're in line, you know your canvas is the correct proportion. The little viewfinder I showed you a minute ago, it actually has little markings on it that tells you, uh, let's see, they're hard to read, but like 12 by 16, this one says 8, eight by 10. It's, it's all worn off, so it's really hard to see. 11 by 14. It gives you a whole, op, whole bunch of options on here, the little, little markings on these um, on the side here. So what you do is you just sort of stop at that. So this would be 8, eight by 12. That's what that's set for. So this is the correct portion, proportion for 8 by 12. All right, so once we have that determined, then it's on to, um, oh yes, before I forget, there is a little hole in this. The little hole is really not to do so much with composition as it allows you to isolate a color or a value. So you can look through and um, determine whether what that actual color or value is. And so that, that makes it easy because it's surrounded by a neutral gray and that makes it a lot easier to identify that color. So that's what that little hole is for. All right, so let's generalize. First of all, you notice that I didn't call this um, rules of composition because as far as I'm concerned, there's no rules in, in art. And if you sort of, but if you, there are guidelines, there are sort of tried and true methods. So I call this guidelines instead. So if you know the guidelines, then uh, you can you can um, uh, break the rules, as it were. So you can learn to break the rules, but you have to know them first. So as a rule, or as a guideline, we we have a, a usually a standard rectangular format. That's the most common, and you you all know. I'm sure by now the the rule of thirds and so on. So if you are doing a composition and you want to do a horizon, you want to put it on the lower third or the upper third, uh, not in the middle. So most of us know that. But as a rule, as a guideline, I'm going to say this a dozen times. I know it. <laughs> uh, by the way, in case I forget. If you have a question as I'm going along, please put it in capitals. It makes it a lot easier for me to find it because I'm kind of glancing at the at the chat at the same time as I'm I'm talking. So it uh, it makes it hard for me to read and talk and, and and draw all at the same time. So I'm going to go and and take this sort of middle area and I'm going to draw a kind of an oval in there. So as far as I'm concerned, pretty much anything in here is fair game. Yeah, that includes the middle. You could get away with that, but pretty much anything in there. The one place that really is an awkward place to put a center of interest is, is anywhere sort of like in a corner <laughs> or, or right at the edge or something like that. It's not that it can't be done, it can be, you know, you'd, if you're skilled with your, um, with your other elements in there or your other areas of interest, um, as, as long as it doesn't bring down the, the viewability, if that's a word, of your um, composition, then it's fair game. So in truth, nearly anything on here could could potentially be uh, your center of interest. Uh, but, you know, this is the safe zone, okay? The safe zone is, is in there. All right, so uh, 
there are a number of things, that, so many tools that you can put in your toolbox for uh, for creating composition. And uh, one of them, uh, the most important, per, in my opinion, is value. All right, so you have your you have your uh, surface here, and you want to create a. Uh, let me grab a. I'm just going to grab something here. Oh, I can't see it. Hang on a second. Just going to grab a couple of markers here. All right, so these are value markers, and uh, it, this is not a bad idea. You know, just to take a piece of paper like this create these little sort of thumbnail sketches and so on. But, uh, so I have several values. I've got light and medium and dark. And so if if I were to do, uh, if I'm looking and I wanna see what the landscape is, I know that my sky is going to be very light, which I could I even just leave the white of the paper, but you know, that's very light. Then we have our, our land. Let's go a little lighter than that. Um, right, we have our land and then we have something like a tree. All right, so we have our tree and it is dark. And I, you see how generalized I'm making this? These are just real basic shapes. So think of that think about that we're talking about values but i'm also talking about shapes here so maybe you've got uh you know a couple of different things here maybe some of them are closer than others uh, that type of thing that could even be a couple of sailboats for heaven's sake but uh you know then i don't know you might have s s another shape somewhere maybe it's maybe it's a, a house or something like that right something like like that so that might be your uh your landscape and you need to have like three values in order for you to really sort of see the dimensionality of something so let's talk a little bit more general here hang in there marker don't don't conk out on me <laughs> all right so um where you place elements in in your picture can make a huge difference right so as i said you could put something in the middle but it has to be done thoughtfully you have to do it in such a way that um, it will strengthen the the interest right so if i were to take this same uh, tree and put it right in the middle because I see this quite often. And this is the way a lot of people end up taking photographs, is you put it right in the middle, and then you've got um, a house here, and you've got like another tree here. And what is wrong with this? It is too balanced, it makes it kind of boring, right? There's nothing that leads us in, there's nothing that connects any of this. Uh, so there's certain things we need to have uh, shapes and the shapes um, can create quite a different effect depending on what it is. So let's say, for example, I take a, a triangle and I do this. And then I do this, another triangle. And I do this. gives quite a different effect and what it's doing is it's leading me right to this spot in the middle here so these shapes can help bring the eye to wherever you want the viewer to look so you are the conductor of this orchestra <laughs> this this orchestra called your painting so you can direct them with with these shapes right different sizes and so on but basically that's pretty much bringing everything in there so what if i took this composition and i did something like a sun here 
and I had shapes that radiated from this. Right. Well, that's kind of that makes this obviously the the place where you want people to look. Uh, this one here, I would probably connect that somehow with more trees. You know, there's things you can do to connect things in your painting. All right. So um, in terms of shapes, like let's let's take another shape. One of the most important shapes is is that we're hardwired to understand is an arrow. Right, so an arrow can lead you to something very easily, and something like an X or you know a circle with a line through it. We know that that's a that's a no. We're conditioned. We we already know what that means. So if I were to put an X here, that's a stop. This is a go, and this is a stop. Right. So we can use these kinds of things in our composition in order to um, to strengthen or to tell the viewer where they need to look. I mean, it's pretty hard to tell somebody where to look, but you can use these tools in your composition to help um, make the eye flow through. So I'm going to get a new piece of paper here. And um, now there's a couple of things that aren't really the best to use in your painting. Let me try to do this in a in a um, a more logical order here. Okay. So, um, one of the next obvious things that we can do if you want to direct somebody's view uh, and kind of going back to shapes here, if I were to create a uh, a pattern of some sort you know let's let's say it is the forest right you've got a bazillion and one leaves they're like this you know all these leaves just kind of like this all over the page there you go not very interesting you need a center of interest so let's let's put a center of interest in here let's put a really dark uh, tree right here right and we can put a, a dark tree there now what else can we do you could you could use value I talked about value already so you can use value so if I really wanted the viewer to sort of really um, focus where that tree is uh, I could put a lot of this uh, in In, in a darker value, kind of around this, and then overlap. And so basically I'm keeping a light area right where the tree is. That's going to emphasize that even more. What about lines that lead in? I could, I could lead in with lines here. So I could, uh, for example, this tree could have a shadow. So the shadow could come from here and uh, I could even have have a path, you know, that's going going towards the tree. So here I'm going to use it's almost an arrow that I'm going to use here. It's going to go around that tree, but it kind of points to it, doesn't it? So I can do that. And it's amazing what you can do to to tell the viewer where where they need to look. So make that extra dark, put the contrast there. So there's contrast. There is a lead in line. There's um, the uh, values. Of course, you can't have values and not have con. Like you can't have contrast and not have values. You need to have uh, two different values in order for that to happen. Uh, but we have a, a strong shape, All right? So maybe we'll even take that off to the top here, All right? So we have a strong shape there. Um, 
in shape. All right, so one more thing here. What if I were to make something like red on there? Wow, that's instantly going to um, bring your attention to that spot. So if I were to um, create this red here, this is why when you see the, the classic walking through the woods and there's always somebody with a red coat. <laughs> Often a dog too, right? But there's always somebody walking down the path with a red coat. Or the ever so famous uh, lady with the red umbrella. <laughs> you know, those. it's because those are um, compelling. Those kind of draw you in. And all those lines that lead to that area are what strengthen your composition. Now I'm going to tell you one thing that I would not recommend. Uh, so let me put down color here. One thing I would not recommend is taking your line to the corner. So for example, if I did my tree here and then I have my tree going off into the corner, there's something psychological about that that it, it leads you away. It's funny that this line leads you in, but this line leads you away. It takes you out. And the corners are like an exit, and the sides are like an entrance for some reason. It's just the way we're hardwired. But the um, if you have a line that goes right off to the corner, it kind of draws your eye out of the picture. You also don't want to draw your eye to the painting beside yours in, if it's in a show, right? So you want to keep the, the viewer in your, within your uh, framework there. So the placement of this, um, I'll put that down to placement, is very important. All right, so, uh, oh, the this this definitely showed the oddball shapes and sizes. Uh, if I were to take um, and and it had the same sort of forest, what if it was um, you've got your forest again and it's lots and lots and lots of very very similar trees, uh, leaves and things like that. So what if I were to take and uh, draw a line across here? And like this, not not to the corner, close to it, but and then I did this shape. You instantly know what that is. It's in the it's in the thirds, like it's within that oval that I showed you. It is different than the other shapes that are in there, even though I'm only using black here, but I can do that, I can create uh a different shape to make that happen. There's also the idea of scale. Uh, if if I were to take, let me put this one down here, scale. So if I were to draw just uh, rectangles or yeah, we'll do rectangles all over the place. There are little squares all over the place. Now, you're obviously not going to be drawing squares and making that into a painting, but uh, there are certain things that could give you that whole idea. I'll give you another example after this, but what if I were to take all of a sudden and put a circle in there? And um, even if it's the same size, let's make these a little bigger, even if it's the same size, you notice it because it's the odd one, right? So you can use the unusual shape uh, to draw the attention. Remember your whole goal is to grab your viewers attention and keep it there. Now while this might work in terms of uh, you know that one's odd and that kind of draws your eye there, there's nothing really compelling about this so it needs other things. So don't just take one of the tools and say, okay, I've got the rule of thirds and uh, 
you know, my horizon's a third of the way down. I don't have to think about anything else now. That's not true. You do need to think about other things, lead in lines and uh, soft and hard edges and values and shape and scale and size and, and things like that. So you need to think of all of those things. If you want to really make a powerhouse type of composition, those are things that you can think about. Uh, so let's um, let's talk again a little bit about lost and found edges. So lost and found edges. So if I were to draw a line in my in my painting, and I see this very very often. Okay, so let's let's do this example. I draw a composition and it's got trees in it like this, right? I'll, I'll, I'll use this one right here. Now, if I were to draw another tree, but this time I didn't draw it all the way through, and I left gaps in it like that, that gives you the chance to sort of break it up. Maybe those are leaves or something, right? So you you might have a few leaves in front and that kind of breaks up that that continuous enter and exit kind of uh, effect, right? This kind of comes in from the bottom and goes straight out the top in a very straight line. So uh, let's, let's add line to our list here because that's very important. So having a break in the line is really important for slowing us down. Think of a, a hard line as a, as a closed door. Think of a, um, an, a soft line as a pathway to help you, like to lead you somewhere else. So I probably would need to get my brushes out for this next one. I don't have my, uh, don't have my water handy, but, um, I'll grab, let me just grab some water here for a second. Okay, and if I were to take my brushes and draw a line, and it is a straight line, like so on, like so. That is very static and it really holds your tension, but only for a minute. And so if I'm in, I'm, if I'm in a composition here and I want the eye to flow through, I might consider something like softening an edge. Right? Take a little bit of uh, paint, uh, water and soften an edge. So let's, let's soften this edge. Maybe I'll even soften part of this side. Right? So what that's doing is that is allowing us sort of a, 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 the ability to visually continue through the painting. So I see this a lot with clouds. Let's use clouds as an example. So you draw your sky and you have um, a lot of clouds and you do them all very sort of crisp shapes. And they're all very, uh, very static looking. They're, they're like puff balls and they're just stuck in the sky, right? Uh, there's no getting the eye to flow through. So you've got a sky. This is ordinary paper, so it doesn't paint very well, but you get the idea. All right. So now what if I took, and I wanted to help the eye flow through this sky a little bit better without, without the stop and start of these clouds. I could just take a little bit of uh, water and soften up some of these edges. How about if I soften up some of these edges? And then what that does is it allows my eye to go from light 
to dark seamlessly. It, al it allows my eye to flow through. And this is what, one mistake I have to confess. I made a lot when I was starting my uh, painting because I used um, I used uh, hard edges pretty much on everything, right? It's so like I, I'm painting this now. I'm painting the, the apple in a still life. So I'm going to make it all crisp. And then I'm going to paint the jug that's behind it. Now I'm painting the jug. So I do the outline of the jug and I paint it in and everything else. And I just painted everything as if they had no relationship to the other things in the picture. So I want you to, I'm going to give you some homework. You go look at some of your favorite watercolors and notice, notice the use of those soft lines. It's something that we don't pay enough attention to, uh, sort of uh, across the board, I would say student-wise, um, there's just not enough attention paid to softening of edges, softening of lines, and helping the eye flow through. Because this is a tool. This is one of the tools that really helps the eye flow through. Like, I, I would have, if this line were still straight like this and hard, my eye would hit there and stop. But now that I have this little passage through here, I can continue to the other side. It's like an open door. So something to keep in mind. Um, <clears throat> okay, let me see what else I have on my, uh, on my little notes here. Okay, so we've got... Um, okay, the whole, the whole idea of the... Uh, you know, the the third rule of thirds, as they call it, or the, the golden mean, and that sort of thing. The ideas behind that is the asymmetry. Right? So symmetry can work, but it's it's got to be really done well. For example, let's take a salt and pepper, okay? Salt and peppers usually look exactly the same. So Here's what you can do compositionally to resolve that problem. Because you need to think like an artist and how can I resolve this? So if I had a salt and pepper and I put them side by side, they'd look like bookends, right? So they need to touch, right? So overlap one in front of the other. So let's, let's take this one salt shaker here and we put it there. And what if we put the other one, we could put the other one behind, but what if we did something even different? What if we laid down the other one? What if we laid it down on the table like this behind the other one? Well, that really makes the, it really makes it look a lot more asymmetrical and more interesting because they're not equal heights, right? So we're, we're changing up that um, symmetry there. And uh, in fact, this would even be stronger if I had the the one lying down facing in towards the other one, leading in the line. All right, so so let's use the salt and pepper example here for a second because <clears throat> these are things that will um, that you'll you'll probably run into at one point. Like you might have, uh, well, let's do the salt and pepper, and then we'll get into something else, but. Uh, <clears throat> so we have the salt and pepper, obviously side by side doesn't work. Laying one down beside the other helped for sure. I'm going to move this um, this salt over a little bit more. And then I'm going to draw the pepper next to it, leading in. But there's something I did wrong here. And that is that I didn't really overlap them. What I did was I touched them. They're kissing, like they're, they're, they're making like a little X right here, right? There's a little X in that spot. And remember what I said about X, it makes your eyes stop and then it doesn't um, flow through. Do the same rules apply to still life composition? They absolutely do. <laughs> There's no rules. We don't need to, we don't need no stinking rules. Isn't that what that <laughs> they, they say? We don't need rules. Yes, but um, there are guidelines. So to resolve the the salt and pepper 
This is this, by the way, is called a tangent. And a tangent can happen if if it uh, goes to the top of the page. Let's put another one back here. You know, so if it touches the top of the page or if it touches something else, it creates this sort of visual friction. So it, it's for for us it's a little unsettling but we want to kind of we want to connect those things but not kissing right so what i would suggest is take your salt over here and uh, and then with the pepper let's bring it right over so it's kind of tucked in behind there a little bit all right but it's still kind of stuck in the middle right it doesn't it's kind of like okay it's okay one thing I use a lot in my compositions is the effect of light because what does light give you shadow and shadow gives you line so line and value so if if I wanted to create a something that sort of leads us in I could create a shadow here and a shadow here and you can see that that creates a lead in line now because it's a shadow we don't have anything winding here so that you know winding can be a little bit helpful because what that does is it kind of slows down the viewer uh, so you might put in something else that is a little bit more um, not so much in a straight line like a highway. I mean, you obviously go fast on a highway, but you want to take the winding route, route right? So, for example, um, let's uh, let's let's put a a plate or something behind this. So, with the plate, we would have um, or a bowl or something like that. We would have <laughs> okay, it's a bowl but we would have these sort of lines. Look at that bowl, it's half on, half off the picture, but we would have this uh, curve that takes us to this main subject here. So yes, in terms of compass or still life, absolutely you can use these ideas. And so I've created a number of shapes here. Uh, it's a little off balance at the moment because of the way I did that. So I might have to, I might crop this differently. Maybe I would, uh, I might uh, take off that. Let's take that off. I'm, I'm not going to add that in. All right. So, because I don't want this in the middle again. If you know, you start cropping things, you don't want to put things back in the middle. Um, one of the things I might suggest to you if you want to get better at composition, because I once had somebody ask me, how do I get better at composition? Do you have a camera? Do you have a phone? It has this little viewfinder on it, right? Your, your phone automatically has a viewfinder. You look through it to take a picture and you just hit the button. You're composing. So if you want to sort of fast track your, uh, your composition skills, then I would recommend taking photographs. It's a fast way to do it. Photographers certainly know about composition. All right, so let's take the example of, of a uh, mug shot, okay? So we have a mug shot. And we have this guy right here and He's going to do time and hit. That's his mug shot. All right. So we have this mug shot and it is kind of boring. It's right in the middle and it's either face on or it's profile. But what would happen if I did something like, uh, you know, the rules of, of the scaling? Okay. So I'd, I had bit large things and small things. What if I had. 
somebody back here, a little photobomber. <laughs> well, we got this little guy back here, and he's smiling behind this guy, and uh, you know maybe some other people back here. So then you've got something called a secondary interest. So when you have something that is, uh, you know, just boring and it's right smack in the middle, like a fried egg kind of thing, you can, you can actually work around that. You can actually get things to, uh, to work if you get creative about it. So, uh, you know, let's, let's do this guy and he's, he's waving, right? So, I did this recently in one of my paintings where I uh, I did a silver uh, sugar bowl. I put it on a striped cloth, and, and the perspective of the striped cloth brought you right into the middle of the, the uh, sugar bowl. And there I am with my camera, <laughs> or with my phone, taking the picture because it's reflective. And it makes this sort of secondary thing. Like at first, the first thing you see is a sugar bowl. It's the very first thing. A very high contrast that sort of thing and then you start looking closer and you can see me in there and that makes that sort of secondary interest so secondary interest why do we do it like why do you even need it in there engagement like you need to keep somebody in the picture right you want to keep them in there longer if it was just a sugar bowl it would be one and done and out you go you'd, you'd be on to something else Oh, okay, sorry, I, there was a question. You forgot to put it in capitals. Let me read back. Um, one of my favorite well. One of my favorite wildlife painter, he paints animals in number like a herd of deer who often paints some halfway out of the picture. Is that okay? There are some guidelines about it. Yeah, that's absolutely okay. Uh, but within this herd, there's usually one or two, like, you know, okay, so the question is, in a, in a composition, you have things coming into the picture and out of the picture? Yes, that's perfectly fine. But you'll have one that's going to stop that speeding right through the, from, from left to right. You're going to have one that's going to grab your attention, maybe two. Right, you might have one or two animals right in in the middle of that. That's really going to uh, make you sit up and take notice of them. <clears throat> so, um, so this is one way to um, keep the viewer there. Right, secondary interest. Um, I want to make sure that I got the question. Yes, yes, I did. Okay, so uh, what else can we do to slow down the viewer, right? So that, that's our goal. We want to slow it down. You have to re always remember the why. You know, it's so easy to get seduced by uh, like a lovely flower or, you know, the colors are so amazing and, you know, there's all, and yeah, they could be. But to just do a flower and not have anything else interesting or secondary in your picture can just make a fleeting glance for the viewer, right? So they'll look at it, they'll go, oh, that's nice. And then on to the next thing. You need to give them something else to, to engage them. So for example, um, and this is a classic and I know you've seen it before, uh, but let's say you've got a little a little cabin or something right you've got a cabin let's put the put the horizon back here maybe we'll put in some trees and things like that but that's kind of boring so what if we instead took the uh, took the slow route the winding road into into the uh, cabin right you can't speed through this because of the way the the composition, oh, there's a tangent, let's take that out for a second. Um, but the way that kind of slows the viewer's eye down and leads you, obviously leading you right to the cabin, 
These are important things to include in your composition. So how do artists do this for something? Well, that's great in a, if you're standing on a driveway leading to a cabin, that's great. But how do artists do this when they're doing something like a, like a still life, for example? So for a still life, one of the, one of the most popular methods of uh, creating lead-in lines, and you've seen it before, I know you have, is drapery. So people will use draping of fabric, for example. Um, so in, in my instance, uh, like I had a couple of eggs, and the, the fabric is running off the table like this. Uh, you know, the, the tabletop is here somewhere, and the, the fabric is sort of draping around this this egg and that those are all lines that lead you right into right into here right so that's one way of doing it you can use um, utensils like you know you if you have something in your picture like this and then I put something else like that these are drawing you into this composition right so you can expand on that uh, sometimes people will take like um, some flowers and they will have a curtain behind that comes down behind the 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 uh, flowers and then you know they might have shadows leading you into the flat into the flowers as well so there's a lot of things you can use shadows you can use fabric you can use um, you know winding lines like a like a road use the secondary interest things like maybe maybe there's another little cabin back here little little interesting one back there give a little something extra um maybe something a little unexpected and once you sort of have these guidelines down so you want to avoid a tangent so that's a that's something you would typically try to avoid just because it creates a stop and, and it, it's just kind of visually uncomfortable to see two things kind of kissing. Much more interesting when they overlap. Um, but, you know, our little, our little sort of crowd in behind our, our mugshot makes our mugshot more interesting. I mean, photobombers figured that out for a, a long time ago, right? So, um, um, yeah, I was, I was saying to somebody the other day, you know, when you see those Google vehicles you know the, the google maps vehicles and they're going down your street um it's kind of a funny thing you know when you see people posing for them like for example you know you might lie down dead on your on your driveway or something like that and throw a ladder beside yourself and <laughs> make it look like you've fallen off of a ladder some ridiculous thing but um you know do something in your painting to make it interesting so uh so going back to our, our list here, things okay, things to avoid, uh, tangents, and uh, corners. Don't don't draw uh, lines right to your corners, and that goes for um, lines, but it also applies to light uh, light areas. Tend to sort of lead you out of the picture when it's very very light in the corners that's why that whole uh, vignette effect works so well uh, in keeping your eye in in your framework if you keep um, you know it's a little bit darker towards the edges helps helps the eye sort of focus on those areas so I'm gonna say line and uh, light in the corners that's that's something that it's not wrong to do it but um, you you need to do it thoughtfully like you, you know you need to do it in such a way that maybe it's a it's a light vignette like it's a um yeah it's just a lighter vignette instead you know and you've you've seen that you know when you've seen people and they just use the white of the paper for example as a background and then you've got white in your corners then that that would be fine but um one other thing i need to talk about is positive and negative Okay, so positive and negative can really create a, uh, a lot of um, visual interest in your painting. So 
if I were to draw an apple, and fill it in, I'm drawing a positive apple. However, if I were to draw the same apple and shade around it instead, I am creating a negative. So I'm not, I'm creating the apple shape, but not through, uh, not through actually painting the apple, but not painting around it. So so that is negative, so positive and negative. And that is very useful in, in your uh, composition. And I had said earlier that if you used a composition that was um, a still life and you paint your apple and then you paint your vase and then you paint your flower and you paint each of those elements and there's no connection between them, that can really make your painting look very stiff and static. So watch those edges. So I'll give you an example. Where's my paints here again? Right. So if I were to draw my apple and Let's say, let's say it's got some shine on it and so on. And I draw this apple. And the, the light is on it, so I continue painting and continue that. What I'm doing is I'm connecting that shadow to the apple. And so those two things that would have otherwise been quite separate, end up being sort of connected. So by connecting elements, you can um, help the eye flow through your painting. This same shadow may connect to the, the vase that's next to it. Let's say it's a white vase um, or something like that. Right, so they're connected that way. So we're making connections. Let's add that to our list. Connections. Oops, I'm writing that unit, so it wasn't even on screen. But um, our list is growing. All these tools we can use, right? And then, going back to this for a second, if I were to take and use a negative painting to emphasize the highlight, oops, I kind of messed up my apple there, shape, and I did a dark shape around this, I've created a lot of contrast and that contrast really draws the eye to these subjects. So obviously we want people to look at, at the objects and not the background. So it's very important to make sure that there's higher contrast. So where the eye ends up looking is, I guess this would be connected over this way, but where the eye ends up looking is obviously at those at the high contrast. It's also going to look at where there's more detail. All right, so maybe that's your tabletop. But I have managed to connect the background now to the shadow, to the vase, and to the apple. So they're all connected and there's a lot of uh, soft lines that are making that happen. Even though the contrast, look how, how much contrast is here. We've got the white white of the jug and the darkness of that background, which is extremely dark. So, but I can bring this right down into the shadows and connect all of that. And 
just making sure that I am softening lines as I go along. So this whole line softening thing, it's usually something that you have to do by um, like dampening your brush and softening while the paint is still wet. Because uh, if you if you just did it on dry, it would just grab and you'd have a hard line and that would that would be the end of it. Space in front of a moving object must be greater than space behind it in the frame. Space in front of a moving object must be greater than space behind it in the frame. Um, I'm not really quite following that. Uh, but Let's say a moving object. Okay, we'll, we'll talk about a moving object. Let's say the, uh, we are talking about maybe a waterfall. Okay, so you can, you can do a waterfall with really crisp edges, right? And that, you know, in, in photography terms, that's called uh, stop action, you know, where you actually freeze it. Uh, you know, it's it's like the shutters open so fast and closed again that it stops the water drops that are, you know, airborne and things like that. And it gives you all these crisp edges on that. But if you really wanted to make your painting look like the water is flowing or in action, as, as you were saying, uh, maybe, Karim, you could um, rephrase that because I'm not really sure I understand the uh, if that's a question or if you're making a statement there or um, I'm not really sure, or maybe an exa give me an example of what you're talking about. But uh, anyway, so if, if we were to do a waterfall and you wanted the water to look like it was flowing over the fall, you could soften the edges, you know, maybe the water's splashing up and it's in, in motion, so you could you could actually uh, sort of do that on damp. So the water's coming down over a waterfall and it's not softening very good, great on this paper, but you get the idea. And then you might do uh, your darker background. Maybe it's a bunch of rocks or things like that. Usually that's the case. So you might have your your sort of rocks here or in the top of the waterfall, that type of thing. But this is where the action is, the bottom of the waterfall. So you might want to soften some of these lines at the bottom. Remember that's going to connect your, your waterfall to the background and not make them waterfall here background there. Uh, you know, it's actually going to help your eye flow through your painting a little bit better. So, um, you know, maybe there's some rocks over here too. Let's just, uh, we'll imagine a little waterfall here. There might be some, you know, trees and things like that. So maybe you've got a bunch of branches and, and whatnot, maybe a rock in the middle, something like that. But, um, but make sure that you don't just have all hard edges. You're just working on dry paper kind of thing. Make sure that you're either dampening a paper before you, uh, before you paint into it or soften some edges as you work. Uh, but remember, that's your homework. You go look and and just take notice how many how many really nice paintings that you enjoy, how many soft edges are in it. Um, I I would have to say that's probably the most sort of neglected or forgotten um, technique that you can use in order to connect and strengthen a composition. Uh, but uh, let's add this in here. I'm going to add to my list here. I'm going to add a uh, line. I'm going to put soft. 
um, soft and hard edges. All right, so we've got a lot we can use in order to make our compositions stronger. Um, I don't know if I'm forgetting anything. I don't think I, well, I probably am. There's always something else that you can add, you know, in order to make it interesting. Um, I didn't see the the composition, but, or the, 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 uh, uh, rephrasing of that one question about space. Space in front of a moving object must be greater than the space behind it in the frame. Okay, I'm thinking I'm thinking that what you're saying, I believe what you're saying is that when something's in motion, let's say it's a cyclist and you're coming this way, if you have space in front, you've got sort of this mo forward momentum and it looks like they're coming into the picture. Whereas if they're really close to the edge, it looks like they're going out of the picture, which is going to draw your eye out of the picture. Uh, I believe that that's what you're talking about. Um, so if if I drew a cyclist, uh, let's let's say you've got a cyclist here, and they're coming in, but but there's another cyclist like here this guy's ready this this guy's heading this way he's heading out of the picture whereas this guy's heading into the picture and I believe that that's what you were talking about in terms of uh, yeah that, I, I think I I think I understand your question now so yes that uh, that is again lead in lines right lead in lines and uh, so you, leaving space, uh, I guess I should put space on here. Where am I gonna put it? I'm running out of room. Oops. Uh, spatial, uh, um, we'll put co spatial considerations. And that's kind of what I'm talking about there. It's spatial considerations. So, you know, if you kind of, I did this one painting when I was younger and uh, I was really proud of it. I did such a good job. And it was all squished over into one corner of the painting, in, in the corner of the canvas. And it was actually a canvas. So it's not like I could move it at that point. Um, but I was, it was too heartbreaking for me to, um, to start over or try to erase it and put it somewhere else uh, at that point. So, so I did leave it, but, uh, I didn't think it through, you know, I didn't think it through, uh, I guess cause I spent so much time, uh, actually getting the drawing done that I, I didn't have the heart to do it again. So if composite, if that happens to you, let, here's a little word of advice, do your, drawing on something else draw like you know this kind of paper for example and you'll do your drawing on there and then transfer it because then you can place it and center it wherever you want to also if if the thing goes wrong you've got the drawing you don't have to start over again you just have to retrace it or retransfer the the image onto your canvas or your paper or whatever the case may be so I'm sure that there's a hundred and one other little little tips and, and tricks that I could give you about composition. That's probably kind of a lot anyway. But uh, anyway, uh, I think that's covered sort of the, the main stuff. I tried to give you a couple of examples, practical examples, like, like the still life or the waterfall, connecting those elements, you know, making them somehow have a relationship with other elements in the picture. Uh, that would be the big thing for me, I think. Um, the big point I'd like to get across. Uh, but, you know, consider things like uh, different heights. Like like I said, the, the, um, the salt and pepper, you wouldn't put them, I mean, they'd be the, exactly the same height, be like twins, right? So, do something interesting with it. Uh, you just have to think a little bit outside the box. Get your camera out, get your phone out, just play. And don't forget about light uh, because one of the things, you know, sometimes if the actual 
item or the, the person or whatever doesn't give you the interesting sort of compositional things that you need, try uh, try light, you know, because shadows can often help with that composition. Uh, if you're doing a portrait, don't don't take a mug shot straight on looking at the camera. You notice photographers have have the shoulder leaning in and 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 twisting the body, right? And and maybe even tilting the head a little bit in order to make it more interesting. So there's lots of little things that you can do, just sort of little nuances. Think about them. Think about them and uh, uh, experiment with it and if you have a, a sort of a little sketchbook or a, a couple of uh, paintings that you've got, put, put them up against the wall. When and ask yourself how how long would somebody look at this, right? Is there anything sort of secondary in it that's interesting, or is it just sort of a fried egg in the middle? Uh, think about it. So uh, anyway, I hope that helps. I'm off now to. Uh, go plan our painting for uh, several days up north. I'm hoping to, uh, I'm actually going to be <laughs> painting with acrylics this time. No, I'm not abandoning my watercolors, but I'm just chain switching it up a little bit. So hope that helps and uh, we will see you again next week. So if you have any suggestions, feel free to add them into the comments underneath the uh, video and I will see those and uh, have a great week, everybody. Take care. Bye.